Our scripture reading today comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Hear now the word of God. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Jew and Greek, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two weeks ago on Easter Sunday, I preached about the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus. Last Sunday, on Thomas Sunday, I preached about why you should believe it really happened. Today doesn't have a special name, but I'm preaching about the difference the resurrection of Jesus makes in your life right now. The resurrection of Jesus means at least four things. There are more, but these four are big. First, Jesus told the truth. When God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, he vindicated Jesus' teachings. Jesus' claims and his promises have been proven true. Number two, the promise of eternal life is true. Number three, someday Jesus will return to make all things new. He will heal this broken world and he will raise from the dead those who belong to him. Finally, number four, Jesus can make you a new creation today. And doesn't that sound good? But how'd it work? It's pretty obvious how numbers one through three work, but how does number four work? How does the resurrection of Jesus change my life right now? The answer is much more than just knowing that I have eternal life changes my attitude today. Now that's true because I know that I have a home in God's eternal kingdom. I may be more courageous or generous in this life and that's great, but that's not enough. The resurrection of Jesus does much more. There is a power. God the Father raised his son Jesus from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, Jesus lives in all who belong to him. That's why I say all the time, the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. Jesus lives. And because he lives, he lives within those who belong to to him. This means the resurrection of Jesus is at work in you, transforming you to be like Jesus. 
Our scripture reading says this better than I can. It's really um, a very beautiful and exciting passage, but also kind of confusing. At least it confused me because right in the opening few verses, Paul says that we died with Christ and that we have been raised with Christ. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, if something like that happened, I think I would remember that. What does he mean here? Well, it turns out that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are united to him in a real, deep, mystical way. In marriage, a husband and wife are joined together and become one flesh. The Bible says this is a picture of Christ and the church. There is a coming together, a union, a common identity. And the same is true for every believer. Jesus takes your sin and he gives you his righteousness. In fact, when, when you are united to him by faith and baptism, everything he has belongs to you. Even the glory that he now shares with the Father is yours, though it is hidden, Paul says, but someday it will be revealed. This union between the believer and Christ is so complete that Paul can say in a spiritual sense, you have died with him and been raised with him. Now, I want you to notice that these are facts, not aspirations. You died to sin. You live to God. This is not something you have to do for him. This is something he did for you. It is a gift he gives you. However, and here's the confusing part, this is also a reality you must live into. In other words, your new life in Christ is both a reality that is given to you and it is a choice you have to make every day. And you're probably wondering, how can it be both, right? How can it be a gift Christ gives me and an obligation he lays on me? How can it be an objective fact about me and also a subjective obligation? How can he say to me, you are holy already because I died for you and rose again. And also say to me, you must be holy because I died for you and rose again. In our scripture reading, Paul says in verse three, you died with Christ. Then in verse five, he says, therefore put to death what is earthly in you. Now, wait a minute, which way is it? Did I die? Or did I not? And if I died, then why do I have to put something to death? But if I have to put it to death, then how can I have died? Is Paul just speaking nonsense here, or have I missed something? Well, I hope that by now you're good and confused because I am going to explain this. But to understand it, you have to understand how the resurrection of Jesus changed the world and how the resurrection of Jesus changes you. The death and resurrection of Jesus were God's great victory over evil, sin, and death. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They broke his commandment. They fell into sin. They ruined everything. And evil, sin, and death reigned. But then Christ died, and he rose again, and he defeated them. He won God's great victory. He inaugurated God's kingdom. Now, you might think that history would look like this. You have the age of evil, sin, and death. And then Jesus dies and he's resurrected. And that inaugurates God's kingdom and begins new creation so that after the resurrection of Jesus, there's no more evil, sin, and death. But of course, that's not what happened. Because Christ is risen, but the world is still full of evil, sin, and death. He has won God's great victory, but there is still a mopping up operation. 
God's kingdom is here, but not yet in all its glory. So what really happened looks more like this. You have the age of evil, sin, and death. And then Christ dies and he's resurrected. And this begins God's kingdom. New creation starts with the resurrection of Jesus. But the old age of evil, sin, and death still goes on until someday Christ returns. And then he will make all things new and there will be no more evil, sin, and death from that point forward. But right now, we live in the overlap of the ages, so to speak. God's kingdom is a reality, but we still have the old order of evil, sin, and death. Theologians call this the already and not yet. Already, Christ has been raised from the dead. Already, we have been forgiven and set free. Already God's kingdom is here, and yet it is not yet here in all its glory. And we are not yet free from our fallen, sinful human nature. And evil, sin, and death have not yet been eliminated. You see how it works, the already and the not yet. We live in that overlap of the ages. Now, the same is true for the individual believer. Now, you might think that the Christian life would look like this. You have your old sinful self, and then God regenerates you. You hear the gospel, and he puts faith in your heart so that you believe and you repent and you commit your life to Jesus Christ. And ever after, you are a new creation in Christ. You are perfectly pure and holy. Well, we know that's not how it works because if it did work that way, every believer would be sinless. And we're not. I mean, I know that I'm a believer. I also know I'm not sinless. You know, just this past week, I... That's not important. Just take my word for it. I'm not sinless. But here is how it really works. You have your, your old sinful self, and then God regenerates you. He puts faith in your heart. You were born again as a child of God. And now you are a new creation in Christ. And yet... That old sinful human nature is still there and must be resisted right up until you die. Now, after you die, if you're a believer, then God makes you perfectly pure and holy. You'll be able to love as Jesus loves. You will not be able to sin. But until then, you live in kind of the overlap there where you are a new creation in Christ. That's a reality but you're still struggling with your old sinful human nature. Now, once you understand how this works, our scripture reading makes a lot of sense. As a believer, you belong to the kingdom of God, but you still live in the old age of evil, sin, and death. That means you must identify with the kingdom of God. You must find your identity there, and live by the values of God's kingdom. In the same way, you are a new creation in Christ, but you're still fighting against that old sinful human nature. And that means you must identify with your new identity in Christ, and you must live by his values. In our scripture reading, Paul gives us a powerful metaphor to express this. He says that we must put off, get rid of the old self, the old attitudes and habits, and we must put on new Christ-like ones the way you would take off and put on clothes. Now, when I was a boy, most years I got a new suit at Easter. And I always loved that. 
Maybe you had the same experience. This was back in the days when little boys wore suits to church. Now, that's not so common now, although I did notice this year at Easter a lot of fancy clothes on the children. Some little boys were looking sharp in their vests with bow ties, and the girls were in their fancy dresses. So some of that's still going on. Maybe you experienced that too. Well, I did. I always loved getting a new suit at Easter, and I would wear it to church, and it would feel good. And adults would say, well, don't you look sharp? And by the time I got to Sunday school, I was strutting in. I was looking good. I was feeling good. I had my big wide lapels on the jacket and the big wide collars that came out over the lapels the way we wore in the 1970s. I was an eight-year-old boy in a three-piece suit who thought he was somebody special. A new suit can do that, can't it? You get a new outfit, and it feels good, and it looks good, and you look good in it, at least as good as you ever look, right? And it gives you confidence. That's the difference new clothes can make. And Paul, in our scripture reading, says that Jesus gives us new Easter clothes. And we need to put them on. And this means taking off our old attitudes and habits and putting on new Christ-like ones. And our scripture reading describes both the old nasty clothes we need to get rid of and the new Easter clothes that we get to wear. Paul starts off by describing the clothes that we need to get rid of. And he really focuses on two areas. In verse 5, he talks about sexual sins. And in verse 12, he talks about how we treat other people. Now, obviously, he's giving us a sample here. But why does he focus on those two areas? I think it's because the Christians he was writing to in Colossae struggled in those areas. And it makes sense that they would struggle in those areas because of the culture around them. And it was a culture they had come out of. Remember, most of these Christians in Colossae had come to faith in Christ out of a pagan background. Pagan Roman culture was sexually loose. Immorality and even sexual deviancy were celebrated. That was just a part of their, their culture the way they lived. And these, these Colossians had been wearing those old clothes for a long time. They were ugly clothes, but they were comfortable. This is why Paul says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. So they had worn these for a long time, and old habits are hard to break. So Paul tells them they got to get rid of the stuff. He says the wrath of God is coming, and that must have been a very uncomfortable thought for them. It's so interesting. God created every human being in his own image, and he cares so much that we honor his image in ourselves and in other people that sexual sins bring down God's wrath. As I say, it must have been an uncomfortable thought, you know, for those people back then. Pagan Roman culture was also um, all about proving you were better than other people. It was about keeping other people in their place, very socially stratified, very competitive. And so Paul says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Now you're hearing what he's saying. It's almost as if he's speaking directly to us. Our culture too is sexually immoral. It's obsessed with sex, even though our culture doesn't seem to know the first thing about it. 
Our culture also loves to divide people into groups and get them angry so that they shout at one another. It turns out that modern paganism is a lot like the old school paganism that Paul dealt with in his day. They had temple prostitutes. We have online pornography. They would get together at town meetings and shout and insult one another. And we have social media. But the same temptations, the same broken human nature, the same sins are there. Everything Paul says here is uncomfortably relevant to us. We have to take off and get rid of the same old nasty clothes as the Christians in Corinth. Now, I want you to notice something else here. Paul, like Jesus, taught heart righteousness. God's word is very consistent on this point. Your actions matter to God, certainly. But God cares about a lot more than just your actions. He cares about the attitudes of your heart, your heart and the thoughts of your mind. Now notice that Paul mentions some behaviors. Sexual immorality, slandering another person, telling lies. These are things you do. But he hits really, really hard the kind of sins that happen inside you. In your heart and mind, impurity, illicit desire, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice. You know, it's much easier to get your behavior right. It's a lot harder to get your heart and your mind right. That takes the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus says that your actions flow out of your heart. If your heart is full of lust and anger and bitterness, that's going to come out. And even if you manage to hide your moral depravity behind a facade of respectable behavior, it's still there. And God sees it. You are wearing filthy rags. It's in your heart and your mind that the change must take place. The good news is, verse 10, you have a new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That is, God is at work in you, transforming you to be more and more like him, which is how you ought to be. Now, having described the old clothes that we must discard, Paul describes the new Easter clothes we get to wear. And notice I've been saying we get to wear them because these new Easter clothes are a gift from Jesus. They make you look sharp. They make you feel good. If you adopt these Christ-like attitudes and, and habits, then you will look good. You will feel good. You will have confidence. You will be at peace. Paul says, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The outfit is not complete without love. Now notice what he's doing here. He's describing Jesus and then saying, be like that. But there's more. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I love that thankfulness makes the list twice. And you see what he's done here. He's given us a picture of what you can be like, of what we as a church family can be like. And do you see it? You see how beautiful it is. I mean, honestly, which would you rather have? A heart that is full of lust and anger and bitterness? 
or a heart that is full of thankfulness and love and praising God. The resurrection of Jesus sets us free to get rid of the former and to put on the latter. It is a wonderful, wonderful gift that Jesus has given us. In Christ, you are a new creation. That's a reality. It's also a struggle, but it is a struggle God will win. So let me give God the final word today. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.